Okay, we'll call the meeting to order then, please. This is the Village of Riverside, Illinois special joint meeting of the Riverside Board of Trustees, the Preservation Commission, Landscape Advisory Commission, and the Parks and Recreation Board for Thursday, March 20, sorry, March 18th, 2021. Time is 6 p.m. Uh, we're gonna call the roll, uh, Mr. Mars, should we call the roll uh, by commission? Yes. So uh, if we let's call the, the trustees first and then we'll call Preservation, LAC and Parks and Rec. President Sells. Here. Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Galagos. Not here yet. Uh, Trustee Hannon. Here. Trustee Gisa. Not yet. Uh, Trustee Pollock. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Mars. Here. Also present Village Clerk Haley. Uh, Preservation Commission. Uh, Chairperson Pipel. Here. Uh, Commissioner Coombs. Here. Commissioner Kaplan. Not yet. Commissioner Leary. Here. Commissioner Marsh Ozga. Here. Commissioner Seymour. Here. Commissioner Walsh. Here. Kaplan, Kaplan is here, by the way. Thank you. Uh, for the Parks and Recreation Board, uh, Chairperson Cause. Here. Uh, Commissioner Dvorak. Here. Commissioner in Candela. Not yet. Uh, Commissioner McLennan. Here. Commissioner O'Brien. No. For the Landscape Advisory Commission, uh, Chairperson Maloney. Here. Commissioner Cody. Commissioner Lambrose. Here. Commissioner Plunkett. Here. Commissioner Rubin. Commissioner Schaff. Here. Commissioner Lucero. Not yet. Okay. Is that it? That is everyone. Uh, I saw uh, Trustee Gallagos join us. And <clears throat> we also have directors uh, Malchiotti and Tab with us this evening and also Village Forester Collins is here with us. So the purpose of, of this special meeting prior to our regular board meeting is to discuss the Swan Pond path and also the, um, the sidewalk addition in front of the swim club. With regard to the Swan Pond uh, proposed path, the Parks and Recreation Department and board has technical jurisdiction over the designated parks within Riverside. Uh, having said that, however, we thought it was uh, a good idea to get feedback from our Preservation Commission and Landscape Advisory Commission because they often advise us on uh, hardscape within the village. So that's the purpose of this meeting. The way we're gonna do this tonight is, because we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of chefs in the kitchen tonight, we're going to uh, first have our staff presentation and then we will go through the, the three uh, commission board. So Charlie Pipel, who's the chair of preservation will run kind of a mini, mini meeting within our meeting with his commissioners then chairperson Maloney and then chairperson Koss. Uh, and they will both have a discussion of, of the items and also formulate their recommendations during that designated period. Once that's finished, we'll have public comment if there's anyone from the public who wishes to add anything with regard to Swan Pond. And then we will repeat the process with regard to the swim club. However, with regard to the swim club, only the Preservation Commission and the Landscape Advisory Commission will be involved. So uh, with that, we will begin with the uh, proposed Swan Pond pedestrian bike path. 
uh, and we'll start with our staff presentation and I'll turn it over to Director Tab. All right, thank you, President Sells. President Sells, can I read the intro real quick? Oh, I'm sorry. I always forget. I always forget our COVID litany. <laughs> and I even asked you earlier. So, no worries. Uh, due to the ongoing public health emergency and consistent with the governor's most recent emergency declaration, various executive orders entered by the governor and recent amendments made to the Open Meetings Act, the Vill village president Sells has uh, determined that an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent at this time, and this meeting is therefore being conducted electronically. If anyone during the meeting has any uh, issues hearing each other, uh, please please let the host know through a message um, or raise your hand. And a reminder to the various board and commission chairs that uh, when we're doing an electronic meeting, all votes need to be by roll call, no voice votes. Thank you. All right, thank you. So most of you have probably uh, uh, either watched a previous meeting or read the agenda for this with regards to Swamp Pond Path, but I want to take a minute to kind of summarize what's occurred over the last few months uh, with regards to this. So on January 18th, 2020, the board elected to move forward using exposed aggregate as a material for Swamp Pond Path. On February 18th, 2021, the board chose to include shore, shoreline stabilization as part of the path project through the use of limestone ledge rock. On March 4th, 2021, the board decided to include a river access point, also known as a canoe launch, um, which was desired as part of the project. And during this meeting, staff was asked to evaluate options for a dyed uh, concrete center line. So after the meeting, village staff met with the engineer and conferred with multiple contractors. Um, it was, staff also noted the following points regarding a dyed uh, concrete center line. So there were two types of dyed uh, concrete center lines. One would be a full depth the dyeing of the exposed aggregate. And with regards to this, the full depth the dyeing of a center line, along with the walking path would require three separate concrete pours. The separate pours would require pinning the three concrete components together in order to maintain the structural integrity of the path. Even though pinned together, the structural integrity may still be compromised due to the freeze thaw cycle experience in an often saturated area. The second type of dyeing of the center line would be a surface dye. The dyeing uh, of the surface of concrete, while an option, leaves some concern to its long term durability. The surface would eventually need to be re dyed at unknown intervals. The surface dyeing of exposed aggregate will vary in appearance due to the exposed aggregate itself and the concentration of the stones at the surface. So knowing this information, um, staff recommends foregoing the dyeing of the center line of the walking path, the incorporation of exposed aggregate in the design of the path, similar to the rest of the village's sidewalks is to provide a naturalistic, soft appearance mimicking the natural environment which Swan Pond is known for. The incorporation of a colored center line down the middle of the path may contrast with the surrounding environment and draw one's attention to the path as opposed to the natural beauty of the park itself. So with that, that background and um, having brought everyone up to date for the most part, uh, if there are any questions uh, regarding the proposal, the path itself, uh, any uh, you know, thing to do with shoreline stabilization, uh, myself, the village engineer, uh, Orion Gailey, and the forester, Mike Collins, are on the call. So as you discuss amongst yourself, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask us uh, anything. Thank you. Thank you, Director Tab. Um, yeah, I, I thank you for mentioning uh, Mr. Gailey that he's here with us. So uh, before I turn it over to Chairperson Peipel, uh, I think that we can assume given the staff's research and recommendation that the dying option is, is not a good one. However, if any of the commissioners or board members uh, feel otherwise, please uh, make that known as you have your conversation. So with that, uh, Mr. Pipel, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks uh, President Sells. Um, I think a lot of our comments have been forwarded to um, Orion and village staff um, and they were very attentive uh, including Director Tab in um, responding to those concerns. Um, I also would like to thank the, uh, 
the public works facility staff for marking off actually how wide a 10 foot path would be down there at Payne. I thought that was extremely helpful to understanding the width of this thing. With that, um, as chair, I wanna open it up to members of my commission for their comments and questions. Sandra, do you wanna start? Uh, sure. Um, I, I sent a couple questions to Orion and he actually answered, answered promptly, which Charlie noted. I was looking at the plans, I was concerned about the um, soil stabilization along the river and it seemed very um, uh, uh, contrived, you know, because of the equal stepping, it kind of creates a stair step going to the water. And I know I noticed that there was a photo referenced in the landmark about what it might look like. And what's actually shown in the drawing is much more uh, ryth uh, rhythmical, if that's a word, um, than more natural layout that was shown in the landmark uh, photo. So I, and I actually sent some photos of the Caldwell Lily Pond, which is kind of the other extreme, a very natural looking stone setting. Um, so I was hoping we could, you know, get something that's a little in between, maybe something that's a little more natural rather than a stair, a grand staircase kind of leading to the water. Um, so I, and, and Norian, Orion did get back to me and said that that is possible. Um, I'm not sure we need a landscape architect necessarily, but I just thought it might, you know, need further investigation into a more natural look along the river's edge. I did have another concern about the grading, if there was any grade change. I noticed that it's an ADA compliant walk and that was just another more civil engineering thing, but um, it doesn't look like there's any grade changes along the path. It's you're doing basically putting back what's there, but I, I, it's hard to tell from the drawings. So those are my two questions about that. Oh, I guess I guess have a third one actually. Um, on a canoe launch, you know, just the ones that I've seen, they're much, very, they're very slender paths leading to the water because you don't need a lot of room to carry a kayak or a canoe. Um, so I thought maybe the a staircase leading to a launch may be more appropriate and less, um, less looking like a staircase. The staircase could be flowing, um, and just a little more natural looking launch. That that was my the, the third comment. Uh, thanks for those comments. I actually had uh, pretty much identical comments, so I'm glad that you addressed them. And I think uh, Orian did address some of those comments in an email to you. Um, Orian, why don't I let you respond to that because you um, you responded to his uh, comments directly. So sure. Um, yeah, appreciate your guys' comments. Um, I'll take the easiest one first, Sander. Um, we are not changing any grades out there. We're working in the floodway, so there's no fill allowed in the floodway. And uh, I don't believe we're looking to lower anything either. So it'll, it'll maintain about the same grade that you see out there now. Um, with regards to how it's going to look aesthetically, um, I wasn't sure about what you were referring to in the landmark. So I just looked it up while, while you were discussing. And that is um, very similar and representative of what our current plan would look like. Um, that's a canoe launch in a forest preserve um, somewhere here in Illinois that is very similar to what we'd be doing. The detail that you were looking at where it shows like the one and a half feet, right? That makes it look like a step zone is just a guidance for the, the contractor and we will probably update that detail a little bit to give them a little more variation in what that is, but it's all natural limestone that will be um, stacked like that. So it's, it will have a, a natural look, but it will step at least as currently designed from the, the shore up to the path. And the reason why we're doing that is, again, we can't have any fill in the floodway. So whatever we put in, we have to excavate out. And the most cost-effective way to do that would be to excavate out more or less along the same slope that's out there right now, and then fill that equally with the, the limestone. So if we were to do something even more natural, similar to those Caldwell 
photos that you sent. Um, it would require maybe stacking some limestone in other areas, creating more of a meandering look to it, um, which is certainly feasible. It would just, just be more um, time, effort, excavation, material, things of that nature. Thanks. I had a, a similar question. I don't want to jeopardize because I know my commissioners have time, but um, this ties directly into one of Sanders' concerns was um, just the nature of the drawing show a very abrupt um, line, uh, vertical line in the elevations or actually in the plan. So it's a, whereas, you know, probably a more appropriate um, response would be to kind of stagger those limestone pieces as they go into grade. So it's not just a stripe of um, you know, a, a much more natural appearance. Like, indulge me if I can. <laughs> kind of like that at the edge. And now this is an elevation, right? Yep. And that's, that is what it would look like. If we're taking okay. a, a cut view through that, right? So you're not seeing how they're being laid. That's yeah, just... but it actually, uh, I was going off the plan and, you know, the problem with showing it to architects is that we... <laughs> We tend to follow the plan because that's an instruction to the contractor on how it's built. So right now yep. it's extremely linear and it's right down to the river. But if yep. that's your intent, that's great. That's that's what we wanted to see. Um, yes. Aberdeen, you had some comments too, please. Yes, I did. Hello. Um, and uh, Dan very kindly addressed uh, some of my comments. Um, you know, I, I echo your um, comments and Sanders' comments about wanting to have a naturalistic, um, you know, view on this and one that makes sure that the images that people are seeing in these photographs and, um, you know, the pictures that they have in their head actually do comport with the documents that go out for bid, because that is very key. Um, but I had a question because on the plans, it appeared to me that the uh, discharge pipe and the valve that are at the northernmost end of um, Swan Pond would still be extending past the proposed limestone area by about eight feet, um, you know, from the uh, proposed limestone area into the water or over the water. And my question was, is there anything that can be done to minimize that uh, appearance? Because it is somewhat of an eyesore, that valve and the pipe. Um, and Director Tab kindly got back to me and said, you know, it could be done to um, shorten the pipe. It's feasible, uh, depending on the conditions of the sediment. So, um, you know, I was very pleased to hear that and then um, you know, I had a follow up question, which, uh, you know, we were running short on time and emailing just before the meeting. So I'm not sure maybe you could address it now um, is if that pipe were able to be shortened and brought closer into the shoreline. Do you know how close we could get without impeding the functionality of the valve, um, presuming that it is a functional valve? That would be the first part of the question, Dan. Yeah, uh, Orion can, I guess, back me up on this. The The duct bill valve is, is fairly tall for those that have seen it. It does extend above the pipe itself. Um, and if we were to try to, you know, cover it in a sense, we would be extending the limestone ledge past the water line because we can't, can't bring the valve too close to, to the shoreline because the functionality or the functionality of it and the pure design of a duck bill valve uh, doesn't allow it. So we can't bring it too close and then we can't extend the limestone too far out because then we start getting into, the, like Ryan alluded to, the, uh, you know, the fill aspect of the project. So um, I'm sure there's a happy medium between the two. Yeah. Now this okay. may be a, a dumb question, but um, do, do we know that the valve works? Uh, well, when, as the river, so the whole intent of that valve is as the river, um, drops, the water seeks its own level and flows out of it and so forth. Uh, Swamp Pond does drain fairly quickly as the river does subside. So yeah, it does work. Yeah. Okay. So there's the, the intake on the west side of the path 
for that whole Swan Pond area that floods and that then drains through that pipe and out the duck bill. And the purpose of the duck bill is so that the river water doesn't back into that and then back up into Swan Pond. Um, so to your answer of how far it can get backed up, we can move it as close to the limestone as possible, assuming that the elevation of the river bottom doesn't extend upwards, right? Because we have to have that same elevation for the water to drain out. So we would just need to take a look to see where that elevation is and we can bring it back as far as we can, still maintaining that elevation. Yeah, I, I think that that would help with the, um, the appearance issue. Um, do you have another solution? I mean, is there a different type of valve that we could put on the end that would be less obtrusive or? I mean, there is an inline valve that you could put into that would, would rest inside the pipe and does the same thing. Um, what's, what size pipe is that, Dan? Off the top of your head, do you know? I don't know off the top of my head. I would say it's probably... A 12 or a 16, probably, right? I, would think I was going to guess a 15, but yeah. it's probably right so now. You're probably looking in the five to $7,000 range. They're not cheap. So. And then if it went inside the pipe, this different type of valve, then we wouldn't have to worry about the height so much. With it's the invert is the invert of the pipe is the determining factor there. So you'd still that elevation is still the controlling factor. Um, and the bottom of that duck bill is even the one that sticks up above the water. The bottom of it is more or less flush with the bottom of the pipe. It's just it sticks up vertically above. Right. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's my concern and I'm glad that there are ways to address that. I think- Thanks, Commissioner Osga. Are you, is that about it? Yeah, that's, that's all I have. Excellent. Uh, Commissioner Walsh, do you have any comments? If not- Sorry, no, I don't. <laughs> okay, great. Commissioner Seymour, do you have any comments? I do not. Who else am I missing? I'm good, Charlie. Kimber? So yep, Kimber, do you have any comments? Um, yeah, just a quick minor clarification. For the soil stabilization, is that only around the steps to the um, kayak launch, or are we doing that the full length of the path or some formula of which might be path is a number of feet, you know, from the water? I can answer that. There's there's three different locations where we're doing the limestone ledge rock, and those are at the three locations that have the the lowest elevation, um, which then makes it most susceptible to scouring um, and erosion. So there's is that one the cross hatch on the plan here? Yeah, so you, okay. if you look, uh, if you have the plans, there's one that starts at about station 27 plus 20 and extends for, uh, I don't know, around 50 feet. Another one where the outlet pipe is in the middle of it, yeah. that's at about station 28, 25 and runs about 75 feet. And another one, um, about 29 plus 25 that runs another about 50 feet. Okay, and we don't have any concern about further down the path where it's right on the water just that has been all like checked that we're not going to have the sinkholes like we have now because it's so close. Yeah, those elevations are higher. Um, oh, okay, perfect. Thank so you. Yeah. yeah, that's all. I, it was very simple. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and uh, Ben or Charlie, you guys tell me if this is appropriate for this section. Um, but with regards to the kayak and canoe launch, have we, has the village or somebody done some sort of a water study to make sure there are no undertoes or currents that we need to be aware of? And what, if any, impact to our insurance does this have? Um, I can take a stab at that. Um, and in fact, we had talked about this earlier um, in the week. It really isn't, you know, unfortunately, we started calling this thing a canoe launch uh, in our original conversations. It's better to think of it in terms of a, of a river access point uh, because it isn't really going to be designed uh, you know, to, for, to launch 
canoes. I mean, our thinking is most of the canoers and kayakers that come through our area, you know, they, they start upstream. And it may, it may be that they, that they utilize this access point, you know, to pull a, pull a boat out and go in the town and have lunch or something and then, and then go back. Um, to answer your question directly, we have not done any kind of a hydraulic search to see if there's any kind of, any kind of, I mean, I, I can tell you that I fish down there myself a lot and that corner is a pretty still part of, of the river. The main current uh, is out and of course farther, closer to the Riverside lawn area. And there is a there is an eddy that comes back, but it really dissipates before it gets to that corner. So that's that's my anecdotal answer. And um, Orion, I don't know if you have a more precise response to that. Uh, we have not done any studies regarding undertows there. Um, the the river in that area is very shallow, though I can't say that. Um, so I, I mean, you can easily just walk out there, and the water's below your knees, assuming you're you're not going during flood events, right? Um, so yeah, I don't I don't see a a big Perfect. issue with that. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Kimber. I, I just have a couple of final questions for you, and then we'll get on to our recommendations, if that's okay. Um, a couple of these are real nitpicky kind of contract documents one, but one is that there's a crosshatch area along the whole work area of the path that shows um, removal and disposal of unsuitable material. And that's, mm -hmm. I realize that's a kind of a typical standard detail. There's a point at which though that crosshatch area intersects and crosses over the WPA stone wall. So it might be a good idea to, at, at that point, if you just omit the crosshatching um, along the wall or make a separate note that says retain the wall in place, because as the documents, as I read the documents, somebody could, a contractor who wasn't you could go in there and just remove part of that wall. So. Yep. Yeah, we're still in draft form of these plans. So that's certainly something that we'll clean up before that goes out to bed. Yeah, I'm just doing my job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the other one was, uh, and again, this is nitpicky, and I'm sure you got this one too. So the um, it sh the sidewalk shows a thickened edge detail, and that's obviously because um, we've lost sidewalks there, and it's it's a great idea. It makes the sidewalk anchor closer to the ground, and it, it's not going to move. Um, but I noticed that in the cross section of the sloped area, it doesn't show that detail, and I. I guess my question is, is that a typical detail or is that, and that's an omission from that document or is that, um, is that a specific detail that occurs th through certain parts of the cross section of the walkway? So um, if you look below the detail for the, that thickened edge detail, it gives yeah. the stationing on where that'll be located. So that, that would take us from, from 27 plus 15, so right where the, the southernmost um, ledge stone is up through the right about where the where the furthest north one goes. So it, it's through that entire section. Okay. So maybe just make those two uh, drawings agree, right? Um, yeah, we can. The, the intent of the, the Limestone ledge rock shoreline detail is is just to just for the contractor to see the the ledge okay. stone is really um, accurate, but we can certainly make that note in there. And then I had one other comment, and probably landscape advisory. I'll get to this. So I'm probably stepping on them. Um, one is the ten foot width. So I know eight feet was under consideration, and ten feet was thought to be optimal for reasons of uh, pedestrians and, and bikes going past each other, right? And maybe even the addition of, a, of an emergency vehicle down there if you need to, is that right, Director Tab? Yeah, the four foot uh, bike lane width, um, you know, that's the minimum. Uh, I've, seen, I've read stuff where, you know, I've seen up to six feet wide per lane. So we're kind of right in the middle between an eight and 12 foot path uh, at 10. And then the thought is, you know, or regardless of the path, we at times uh, may need to access the pond for uh, police or fire uh, services. So the, the wider the path, the more ideal it would be for a vehicle. 
Just doing a quick calculation though, if you reduce the width of the path by 20%, I know it doesn't directly correlate to 20% cost and savings of the project, but if you run out of money for the limestone, you could just reduce the path by a little bit. And it's, I mean, just because the, the whole length of the entire path is 10 feet, right? So even if there's areas where it might go to eight feet, you're still saving material cost. I realize it's not a direct correlation because um, it's not all material, right? The labor is going to be essentially similar, but um, it might be a way to consider when you're getting into budgeting. But I, I guess I'm having no problem with the 10 foot width, but it's just an idea. Um, and then the last one was, um, I'll just let the landscape advisory talk about this one, but the plant materials, um, there's a lot of dead trees um, in, the, in the area that uh, along this, the shoreline stabilization area or trees that are kind of suffering. And um, I just wondered about the condition of those trees and, but they can let, let those folks talk about that probably. Charlie, one more thing. Do you, can I, um, is it possible I could present a few photos? I just wanted to show them what I sent Orion. Is I think, that, can I, yeah, I think manager Francis would have to share and make you a co-host maybe, or somebody who knows how to, somebody who set up the zoom meeting. Can I share? I mean, I can, it looks like I can. So maybe. I'm just going to, I don't know if you can see this. There you go. This is the landmark um, photograph. And you can see the steps are undulating and a little more natural. Yep, um, and that's, that's anyway, the that's was, design. Right. Uh, but yeah, you have much more rigid stair steps and these are undulating in and out. And you know, so anyway, I understand there's a little bit of difference. Yeah, engineering but I plans want to are show you different than architectural plans. <laughs> one of the most beautiful places in the world, um, right in Chicago here is, the lily pond at Lincoln Park, which was done by Alfred Caldwell. Um, so you can see some of the natural. The natural settings of the stone, which is much more, you know, it's a more natural looking. Um, but yeah, understood that this is, you know, anyway, that's that's all I wanted to show. So. Great, thank you for sharing that. So if no one has any further questions or comments, can we uh, get on to recommendations then and then we'll hand it over if that's okay yes. to expedite this? Yes, please. So um, what's the what's the um, preference of the board? Would you um, want this in the form of uh, a motion or um, Maybe just we'll, we'll make some some statements and then I'll combine them all into one motion. Maybe that would be the, the most exped, expeditious way to do this. Somebody, Mike Morris. That, that sounds fine to me. Okay, great. So uh, Sander, since you started the ball rolling, why don't you, um, can you give a, a, a a, a, an idea of how this might be worded into a motion? <laughs> Uh, Tom, I need your help. <laughs> um, you caught me off guard on that one. Um, I, you know, I, can, I can hand it over to Aberdeen if you like. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not I, so fact, good. I could do it. I could do it too, but I'm 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 the chair, so I don't think I can officially make a motion. But oh yeah, Ab Aberdeen, do you All take right. a shot? So um, we would make the motion in reference to our standards for um, review, which would be whether um, this proposal um, has a uh, negative impact on our um, landmark uh, designation. So in light of that, I would say, I would move to say that if the following uh, revisions were made to the plan, it would not um, negatively impact our um, landmark status. Uh, and those revisions being A. <laughs> um, a You're doing great. You're doing just okay. great. Uh, a would be, um, well, the um, 
specification that the limestone materials would be laid in a um, naturalistic view comparable to Caldwell's Lily Pond. <laughs> <laughs> and not <laughs> with reference to the uh, linear um, dimensions set forth in detail one of the plans or the, where else does it show that? And uh, is it two on EPC, ECP2? Uh, it's she. DET1. DET1. Yeah, DET1 was the first one, but there it also appeared somewhere else. Um, I think for purposes of the motion, you could probably just say the construction document submitted. Okay, the construction document submitted. Okay, yeah, that's that's probably better because that's all encompassing. Okay, uh, so that was item A. Uh, item B is that the um the pipe the discharge pipe um should be moved closer to the uh as as close to the shoreline as possible in order to minimize its appearance and consideration of a uh internal valve um should be included uh as a uh, item for consideration in the bid. What do you call that? A cost? An alternate? Alternate, yeah, cost alternate. Um, and C, the section of the plans denoting the uh, demolition of or the removal of debris uh, from the area should be amended with a note to specify preservation of the WPA wall. What item am I, am I on now? That was A, B, C. That was C. D, D <laughs> is um, that the commission would recommend um, reduction of the width of the path uh, as a cost saving measure if the limestone uh, and valve segments of the project proved costlier than anticipated. How's that? That's a lot. <laughs> it is, but that's. Well, I think I, I think that's the motion. Uh, can I, and that was, can I interject before you move forward with that motion, real quick? Please do. Sorry to do that, but we're referencing the Caldwell photos there. Yeah. As as I had emailed Chairman Pipel and um, Sander previously, that is not a feasible option for this. Um, now, doing a more naturalistic look. Is certainly an option, um, but some of those cavernous overhangs, etc., are not um, not something that can be done in this sort of application where we're trying to stabilize the, the bank. Thanks for clarification, uh, Sander. I know you brought up the point and you brought up the photos. Would you be um, agreeable to uh, the photo that was submitted to the landmark and that um, that Orion shared with us? Y yes, I mean something closer to that. Yeah. Rather than okay. this rhythm, so, rhythm, rhythm, all right. rhythm this I will I will withdraw item A from that motion and replace it with um, the reference not to Caldwell but to the um, landmark photo. Landmark photo. As long as the term uh, naturalistic is in there, um, I think that conveys what we're going for. We just don't want the, the regularity and the, the uniform dimensions that are in the existing plans uh, to be what controls 
the contractor's output here. I think that's the intent. And I think that the engineer hears you uh, loud and clear. And so we have a motion uh, <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the floor. Do we have a second for that motion? I'll second that. Any further discussion on the motion? Uh, could someone uh, please call the roll? <laughs> Kathy Haley, maybe. <laughs> Commissioner Coombs. Aye. Commissioner Kaplan. Aye. Commissioner Leary. Yes. Commissioner Marsh Ozga. Yes. Commissioner Seymour. Yes. Commissioner Walsh. Yes. All right. I'll vote yes too for the record. Thank you. So uh, that concludes our review and recommendations. Uh, I guess I turn it over to Landscape Advisory now. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairperson Pipel and the Preservation Commissioners. As, as always, you do an incredibly thorough and professional job. I appreciate it. So now we'll move on to Landscape Advisory Commission and Chairperson Maloney. Okay, thank you, President Sells, and thank you to the president and the board. And the uh, Chairperson Maloney, we're having a hard time hearing you. Uh, can you hear me now? Kind of sound distant. <laughs> what the problem is, let's see. How about that? Not so good? Just, just speak loudly. <laughs> okay. okay, if I'm shouting too much, uh, let me know, guys. But anyway, thank you so much for giving us the chance to offer opinions. I'll just go through our members who are here. I know some were able to send uh, comments to Dan uh, Tab, and he responded uh, quickly. So uh, let me just go through the commissioners, uh, starting with Commissioner uh, Julie Schaefer. Julie, did you have any comments? Julie, you're muted. Uh, my two comments, and I didn't get to email them to uh, Dan and Jessica until this afternoon. So I understand. Um, that you didn't have a chance is the width of the path, uh, especially as it nears Millbridge. Um, it's so wide in proportion to the amount of space that for the last third of that path, making it uh, more closer to, you know, reducing the 20% for some of it would help make it more naturalistic. Um, also concerns about the boat launch or even just as a river access point being somewhere where canoes are stored and seen and detracting from the larger VISTA focus that we um, want in Swan Pond. Any uh, response to that? Uh, well, I can start with the first one. And Julia, I apologize for not getting back your email in time. My typing skills did not afford me to answer everyone's emails. <laughs> I, totally so I apologize. Uh, we kind of alluded to the, the width of the path the eight, an eight foot path would be the, the minimum uh, required. Um, ideally, we, it, it goes wider due to the, the cross traffic on bikes and so forth and uh, emergency vehicles. If uh, you know, the board uh, sought to decrease the, the width of the path, um, it has to be at least eight feet wide. But uh, you know, if we were to, you know, the ability to utilize it for emergency vehicles, obviously we would want a wider path because we don't want to be driving in the mud. Um, you know, we would like to access that area year round if, if uh, possible. Um, you know, a lot of the times the high water, whether we have to do a river rescue or, or such, uh, kind of coincides with a lot of mud, right? So we want to, you know, if we're going down there, we want to keep the vehicle on the path. And obviously the wider path would, would uh, benefit that. The other question with regards to the, um, the attention that you know, the river access would uh, garner, I'm not sure we can really predict what that's gonna be until 
it occurs. It's hard to kind of foresee the volume of people or the interest, you know, until the thing's built. And no, there won't there, be any storage though. Okay, so in the scenario where President Sells said that, you know, coming for lunch, mm -hmm. uh, leaving your canoe somewhere, presumably, and um, I guess uh, the question would be how, what, how would that play out? And, you know, I think I've seen ideas floated over time to have some sort of rental of canoes at some, I mean, I that's not a part of this now, but you can see where that could lead to that and that could become sort of a focus point where we want sort of the whole totality of the, um, that and part of Swan Pond to be the focus, the larger focus. Yeah, there's been a couple, throughout the meetings we've had, there's been a couple, uh, I guess, ideas directed towards that. Um, Trust Gallagos did a, had a really good explanation with regards to uh, Riverside not necessarily being a, uh, a put in a pull out site is probably more of a bypass from upstream to a downstream destination. Uh, you know, pulling out a, a kayak or canoe and typically you place it just in the grass. Um, and then I believe another trustee had mentioned at one of the last meetings, if this does become an issue, we may seek some type of temporary, you know, storage option, whatever it might be. But uh, until we kind of cross that bridge, it's really hard to hypothesize as to exactly what that's going to look like. Those are my two Thanks, Julie. And Julie, could I ask you now that we learned from the Preservation Commission that we need to make a, a motion, could I ask you to kind of keep notes? Okay, yes. Going through, and, and I'll ask you to formulate the motion if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, Lisa, I know that you sent some questions to Director Tab. Are you happy? Uh, do you have further questions or uh, are you okay? Yeah, um, just, a, a, I guess, a follow-up question. One of the questions that uh, uh, Director Tab answered was on the gravel bag coffer dams for erosion control. And I, I didn't realize they were temporary. How long would those be in place? Just they through would, the construction of the walls. Mm -hmm. Through the construction, okay, and then they're removed. Okay, great. Anything else, Lisa? No, uh, everything else. I, I did note that there was only, um, I could only fi find one tree noted on the, um, on the plan and I thought I'd missed the second tree that was supposed to be removed. I was just more concerned about what those trees were. But I, I will say this, uh, I thought the preservation, uh, Charlie brought up a very good point on the tree removal. There is quite a few dead and or scrap trees down that path. Has that even been considered in the, in the, the plan at all? With regards to the, the Swamp Pond area, we did a walk through earlier in the weekend, definitely mm -hmm. identified a couple of trees that um, are dead and, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, potential uh, issue. So the, you know, our intent is to get down there with our contractor and remove those trees that uh, deem necessary prior to the construction beginning. So we're not okay. having the, the heavy equipment on the, the new path. Right. Hopefully the final design will coincide with, uh, you know, or at least we'll get it before uh, we do that in case uh, some additional trees do need to get removed. Obviously there's the one noted on the, the plans currently, but mm -hmm. once final designs uh, have been issued, we can, we're gonna walk the path again and uh, measure everything off and make sure there aren't some uh, additional trees that would have to be taken. But yeah, okay. ideally we want everything removed before construction begins, yeah. just so we're not putting heavy equipment on a brand new path. Okay, great. Great. And I guess the, the newest thing I have is just about the uh, plant material. So Orion, I don't know as far as the uh, Forbes that you picked out and the natural grasses, do you have a list of those materials? Or are you going to bring those back to the LAC? We're coming up with a homeowner's guide that is very specific on plant material that we're suggesting to homeowners. So I was just wondering if you have that, that list of plant material. 
We have not selected them yet, other than they'll be native forbs and native grasses, then we'll we'll generally get with uh, Mike Collins to to vet that process. So if you have anything in mind, I'd ask that you forward them over to Mr. Okay, Collins great. and then we can consult with him. Okay, great. We'll do that. That's it, Kathy. Okay. Uh, Yvonne, I saw that Yvonne came up. Is Yvonne still on? Yvonne Lucero? I don't see her on there. Oh, okay. Maybe she dropped off. Okay, Mary Plunkett. Hi, um, thank you so much, everybody. I really um, want to say that some of my comments echo what's happened. It has been commented on before. I'm especially um, concerned about the, the trees because we had such a, a loss several years ago when we had the ice flooding in there that really, really damaged a lot of trees. And my concern is that, um, you know, I know there's concern about bringing heavy machinery down on the path. I also have concern about bringing heavy machinery down into that area and what it will do to not only the trees that are there, but the root systems. And I'm sure that Mike and Dan are looking into that right now because um, we don't want an empty park there eventually. And I know that you're doing a lot to to, to restore as much as possible. But that 10 foot wide path uh, gave me concern because um, having walked that, I as many of you do, I walk it every day or every night. And um, the path as it is right now goes right up to Swan Pond or as close as we can get. And there's not a lot of area to go the other way away from it. So I do have concern about that as well as, and it, it could be nothing at all, but I, I think about um, if we could possibly in the, the paper and everything else, not refer to it as a canoe launch or, you know, everybody's thinking of it as a, a launch now, if it is just a, a drop off or a pass by, that's terrific. Um, a launch is something completely different. And I think that people will be looking for, um, places to tie up their kayak or their canoe when they come through. And Ben could probably speak to this. I'm not quite sure what would what it does. There are so many people who um, fish, as you know, right in that whole area. And I know in nice weather, my grandson's down there almost every single day. Not that he's catching anything, but he's there. And I think it's a really, um, that's something that has grown here in Riverside. We have a lot of people all along the shoreline. And I'm not quite sure, and it, it may not happen at all. You know, it's not like we're going to have a whole regatta come down the area and stop there, but what it would do to the fish that are right in that area. But um, I'm looking forward to it. I think that this is a really important area in Riverside. It's a reflective, you're going down into a really wonderful reflective area. And we do have a lot of people who spend time reading there, sitting there and just enjoying it. So I'm hoping that as much as possible, we can retain what that is and keep the integrity of that entire area while we're going through this whole process. So I congratulate those of you who are working hard on it and I'm looking forward to seeing um, what the end product is. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Mary. I think those are the only LAC members on, if not uh, shout out. Let me add a couple thoughts, uh, much of which has been discussed, so I won't go into that. So let me just zip through these. Can you all hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, in terms of the aggregate, uh, will somebody be responsible for, and who is it, for checking the color of the aggregate because I know uh, at one point a couple of years ago there were concerns that the sidewalk replacement was too bright. Um, so who who is going to validate that it's kind of the darker muted uh, aggregate color before it's all ordered? Anybody? Well, the I guess I'll try try this one. Uh, Ryan, if you want to jump in. 
Uh, concrete can be tinted. Uh, a lot of on the exposed aggregate, the surface appearance is directly correlated to the stones in the aggregate itself. Uh, you know, if they're uh, tightly spaced, then you don't see much of the concrete at all, honestly. Uh, you know, we can't, a tint can be added, uh, you know, for instances where the stones aren't as tightly uh, condensed, but ultimately the appearance of exposed aggregate is dictated on the, you know, the appearance of the stone themselves. Right. So to that point, it's it's whatever quarry the stone comes from and the cement is uh, produced at will dictate variations in the in the color of the concrete. Um, but considering the entire village is exposed aggregate concrete and it kind of varies all over the place, I don't I don't think you really need to tint it. But it's certainly a possibility. Um, I, I just want to know who's going to check the sample. Because I, you know, do, small degrees of variation are not a problem. But if it's hugely bright versus subdued, that's all I'm getting at. So does somebody sample check it before it all comes in? Uh, are are you concerned about variations throughout the path or? No, the total color, total color of it. Okay. That it just um, be subdued as opposed to super bright. So when they're super bright is normally when they put a curing compound on it, that's um, like a bright white look, but um, otherwise for, for this kind of application, it would just be a clear coat sealer that would be put on after the fact. So the, the entire path will be a uniform color. What that color is, I don't know. Um, and I cannot dictate that unless we tent the concrete. Okay, uh, I'm not sure you, you've comforted me, Ryan, <laughs> one way or the other. I know you're attempting. I yeah, mean, I mean we, we specify a pea gravel mix, right? So um, we can't specify the quarry at which the, the contractor that is the low bidder on the project gets that material from. Um, so Could we I, just show, show them a, a picture. I mean, I know it all sounds the same in construction world, but uh, we have had instances in the past where sidewalks have been replaced and they were markedly different looking from the rest of the sidewalk. So we want to, sure. can we just show them a picture of here's the sample concrete that we want and, and so we don't get disappointed when it comes in? Um, I, I don't see the practicality in that, unfortunately, but we can certainly take a look after the first day that they've poured, or we can have them pour a sample um, prior to, to really knocking it all out to make sure that it's um, something that the village is okay with. Um, there'd obviously be to, to doing that. Well, I mean, I don't know. I, I leave it to the people who are doing the cost, but it seems a lot cheaper to make sure you have a, a sample that you're happy with rather than pour the whole thing and then decide you're not happy. Chairperson Maloney, if you could, the sidewalk squares that you're referring to that you were, you felt that they were brighter, perhaps you could send a picture or tell Director Tab um, after this meeting where it's located. I know in more recent projects that um, we've had done, like our intersection improvements and other um, ones, we've had really good success with the exposed aggregate that, that's been poured and I think they've done a really great job. Um, so I'd be interested to know those exact locations because then hopefully we can decipher the, the issues and then make sure that we work through the contractor on that one. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I could find the one that caused the hullabaloo, but I could certainly find ones, which is most of it, that is, that is good. Because I know we've definitely refined in our specs the, the type of pea gravel and the look and, you know, Burke has done a very good job of making sure monitoring those types of projects for us. So maybe if we can narrow it down and we can talk offline after the meeting, but um, to, to get to the, the details of this so we can make sure we, we get it right. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, and then this is similar to what Mary brought up, I think, is just where will the construction equipment be staged? Do we know yet? Uh, the concern being the not only the trees that Mary Plunkett brought up, but also the new plantings in Swan Pond. Yeah, once so, the, I'll take a step at this first. Once the uh, final plans have been drawn up and we walk the site, we're gonna identify the trees um, that need protection. We've kind of already done a preliminary <clears throat> walkthrough with Forrester Collins. So we're gonna identify the trees adjacent to the path that would require uh, you know, tree protection and ones that, uh, you know, the path might uh, get a little close to. And, you know, we're going to try to do a one way in, one way out scenario. Uh, you know, the machinery is going to stay on the path the majority of the time. And then stuff that uh, has to be staged at some point, we are going to find an area that uh, is devoid of trees and roots and drip lines and so forth to, to stage the stuff. And so we're not kind of encroaching upon uh, some other trees. I guess I was thinking about the herbaceous material that was planted on the north side of uh, Swan Pond, the specific plantings that we had, you know, not trees, herbaceous material. Yeah, <laughs> be, that being the, the low spot, we're definitely not gonna put equipment in there. Perfect, okay, got it. Um, Okay, glad about the strike. That sounds great. Um, I did notice, and uh, forgive me for not really being able to read construction plans that well. There is a spot south of the main uh, WPA steps, so south of it, where just looking at the little white painted line, it seemed to go over that meaning on the river side, it seemed to go over uh, a, an embankment that I thought was part of the WPA as well. Am I wrong about that? Uh, and so I didn't know if those, I'll call it rip wrap for less, lack of a good word, if that was going to be removed or if that's historic and that might be more of a historic preservation concerns. So if they're not concerned, then I'm, I don't think I am. Are you referring to those six by six blocks? On the river side, yeah. Uh, I believe right. those were placed by the Public Works Department uh, about yeah. 10 to 15 years ago. Yeah, they're just old sidewalk squares, but we're not, we're not taking, we're not taking any, any of the wall out or any of the um, armoring along the, the river as part of the project. Got it. Thank you. One last question. Uh, and, and it revolves around the river access, aka canoe launch. Um, I share Commissioner Shafe's concern about, you know, I, I love the idea of boating, of uh, human powered boating. Um, I think it's Homesteadian as well. Uh, but I am concerned about pull-ups, pull-ins, whatever you call it, storage, uh, where the boats would go. And I, I think if we, you know, I can foresee signage, a lot of signage going in to specify what's correct and what's not. And so I have two suggestions in that regard. Um, one, if it does turn out to be extremely popular and we do have to legislate by signage and so forth, let's at least get our signage consistent along that walkway uh, because in that general area now where we've got a lot of really nice natural features, we've got the bioswale near the train station, we've got the arboretum signage, we've got the new bird walk signage, uh, and we may have to put signage in here about you know, what can and cannot happen on the road thing. We've got signage for the sleds in the winter. I would like if we could consider having nice consistent signage if that's needed. You're talking about 
uh, a uniform sign for all those purposes? Yes. So that's a suggestion. Uh, if it's, you know, if the, uh, I'll call it a boat launch for now, if it turns out to be, I don't wanna say not popular, but not an issue then where we don't need signage, then that's fine. But uh, we've, we've often ended up having to put signs up in places. And I, I just think it would enhance the whole walkway if we consider consistent signage, if indeed we have to add more. We could definitely entertain the uh, thought if, if we cross that bridge. Yep. Um, that's all I had. At LAC, are we all good? If not, say something. Okay. Good. Can I ask you for a summary? Uh, Kathy, sure. Do you want to go through some of the points? Uh, Dan, am I supposed to make a motion for recommendations? Yeah, similar to uh, how preservation did it. A motion okay. and a second, and Kathy will call the roll. Okay. Um, I guess, Kathy, I, uh, Kathy Maloney, I had maybe five points. Uh, one, uh, that the LAC recommends the village seek a poured aggregate sample prior to installation. Um, two, that uh, Public Works prioritize tree protection and tree removal efforts in tandem with the installation of the path. Um, working with the forester. Uh, three, that um, the village brand, the, it is a river access point, not a canoe launch um, to preserve the tranquility and special nature of Swan Pond. Uh, four, that the uh, Village board consider tapering the width of the path to eight feet minimum in some parts as appropriate, particularly the last third of the path leading to Millbridge. And five, that in the event we need signage, that a uniform system of signage replace an ad hoc signage system that exists now. Julie, we should also have on there about the forbs and grasses. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, would you would you phrase that one? Um, that the LAC will give a list of Forbes and grasses to Orion, Mike, and Dan. Thank you. Perhaps we'll consult with uh, Mike and Dan about because I'm not sure we want to be in the position of recommending a list. How about we'll consult with Mike and Dan, the Forester and Director of Public Works on most productive and appropriate forbs and native grasses? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, okay, do we have a second for that motion? I second the motion. Uh, okay, so I'll go through the roll call uh, and uh, let me know if you are in favor of that. Mary Plunkett? Yes, I. Julie? Yes. Uh, Lisa Lambros? Yes. And that's it, I guess. I thought I saw two others, but I'm wrong. And uh, so myself, I say yes as well. And thank you again to the group. Great. Thank you, Chairperson Maloney, and thank you to the LAC members for your comments and input. Uh, so we'll move finally now to the uh, Parks and Recreation Board, uh, Chairperson Costs. President Sells, can I say something real quick? Of course. Um, I understand that this meeting is uh, live streaming on uh, Riverside TV. And for anyone who's tuning in to see the regular board meeting, uh, this meeting's running a little late and the regular board meeting will commence uh, shortly after this one recesses. Um, so stay tuned for anyone uh, looking for the regular board meeting. Thank you. This is this is the warm up band. <laughs> All right, uh, Chairperson Koss. Wonderful, I've always wanted to be in the warm-up band. Uh, thank you, President Sells. I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Jen Dvorak first. 
Sure. Um, I just had um, one question, and I apologize if this was something that was previously covered, uh, but it appears that there are three, I'm going to call them access points, um, the first of which has like a break in the plantings, so I'm assuming that that is the main access point or the canoe launch main access point. Um, the other two, um, will those have the same look as that first kind of access point where it's kind of the stepped limestone, um, or will those appear different, the kind of latter two? They'll all appear similar. Um, the only thing that'll appear slightly different is we'll have concrete leading all the way up to the one where we have the river access point. Um, as opposed to having the buffer of landscape material between the path and the, the ledge rock. Um, otherwise, okay. they'll all have the same appearance. Okay, so then on those latter two where they're, the plantings go basically between the path and that access point, um, is the intention the same that people would, would go down and you know maybe spend some time on those latter two access points or those more just aesthetically to be pleasing around the river? So the point of those are to stabilize those those shorelines because they're prone to erosion. So um, it's got an aesthetic appeal to it, but that's not the intent of it. The intent of it is just to stabilize that shoreline. Okay, okay. Because yeah, my question was gonna be that if there was gonna be plantings there and people would potentially want to go on those latter two access points that those plantings may get trampled and, and stepped on. Um, so would it be worthwhile to add a little path or break in those plantings um, to prevent, you know, the plantings dying or anything like that. We certainly could if, if the consensus is that we want to utilize all those as more or less river access points or, or whatnot. But the, the main intent for these originally was just uh, to stabilize the shoreline. So we're, we're consistently manifesting from there. So um, okay. yeah, certainly if the board, uh, if the board wants to provide some sort of access to them all we can. Okay. Thank you. I think that was my only question. Great. Thank you, Jen. Uh, John McLennan, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, I had two, two things I wanted to bring up. Um, Sander Kampler mentioned the ADA compliance of the pathway. Um, can somebody speak to the whether or not it is ADA compliant? Uh, if, and if it's not, if it, it needs to be for this? scope of magnitude of work. And then the second thing is um, to contrast the, the 10 foot width of the pass, path and to bring it down to eight feet. I have a concern with that ramp. It has a lot of people coming down and I see kids on bikes on it. Um, and I can imagine, you know, people with canoes, maybe hoteling, kind of waiting to get in line or get in the water. And it might contrast with people going down that path, so the wider the path, I think, might be better in this instance. That's all I got. Or at least in that area, keep it wider. But can somebody speak to ADA for the entire pathway and how, if it is currently compliant and if it's, if it's not, if it needs to be? So to be ADA compliant, um, you can't have a cross slope greater than 2%. Um, so to that extent, um, we will be compliant. Um, there is a fairly large longitudinal slope from Burling down towards the, uh, the river that would probably be somewhat out of spec as far as ADA uh, compliance goes. Um, but I, I don't have those um, percentages handy at the moment, but we can certainly look into that if we want to ensure that it is ADA compliant. So okay. is ADA compliance not, a, not something that's required in this project? Uh, so ADA, at a minimum, you're ADA compliant coming onto the path from Berry Point and Fairbank. Um, the, only, the only potential issue would be from Burling down that, that slope. Yeah. And I would, wouldn't you need two points of exit in this instance, which means that large slope would need to be ADA requirement. 
and I, I'm no expert. I'm just thinking out loud that I understand if you say you're, you're handicapped and you take the pathway all the way down to close to this, this ramp, you know, in the event of something happened on the other side between you and Burlington that you need to exit. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the, if the slope is greater than theoretical ADA compliance allows, um, we can certainly put a landing at the bottom. Um, but to get that slope ADA per ADA compliance, um, it just may not be feasible without doing some sort of switchback to get down there. Um, so like I said, we can look at that a little further. Right. And that's my question. Like, are we required, you know, to, if we're doing this large of an amount of work on this pathway, if there's a requirement to make it ADA accessible. And I don't know that answer. Uh, considering the Army Corps built the original path, um, I don't believe there is any requirements, but we'll take a look at it. Okay, thanks. Thanks, John. And just to piggyback on what he was saying, um, I do have a concern that if it isn't ADA compliant, is that really what is that really something that as a village we want to um, do a major improvement on a regularly used park that we're basically saying that we have a percentage of the population that we're not interested in in planning for. Um, so if it isn't ADA compliant, I think that that's, you know, I think that that message needs to be considered. I understand that there's access on the one end for sure. Um, judging from the way my kids go screaming down the um, other end on their bikes, I'm not entirely sure that it meets the ADA requirement when you come down from over there by the library. But I think that is something we wanna take into consideration, especially, you know, as a Parks and Rec Board, we have been working very hard um, with WSSRA to make sure that we are um, providing uh, recreation for everyone in our community. And um, I don't think that doing a major improvement on a park should be an exception to that as we, as we look ahead. Uh, so that would, that would also be a concern that I think that definitely needs to be looked into. Okay, I think those are uh, the only two on the call. Does, do we wanna, um, John or John, do you wanna make a motion? Uh, <laughs> we, we didn't really ask for anything, did we? If you could just go ahead and review the ADA compliance of the pathway. Yeah, I agree. I think that, um, I think that Jen's suggestion also with the, um, the limestone breaks and the stepping there, I definitely see that as a um, as a place where kids will want to access. Uh, I'd be actually a little bit curious what Chief Buckley has to say about creating such an obvious access to the water. Um, I, you know, at least anecdotally, I've seen quite a few um, rescues have been made on the river as of late. And uh, I'm just wondering how much this is gonna encourage some kids, you know, kids down into the water. Uh, if there's any concerns on that level. Uh, but otherwise, I think that, um, yeah, I think that calling it a canoe launch is not really what we're talking about here. I think what we're saying is this access to the river, mostly for people who want to fish and things like that. And I think that the, like Ben had said, the uh, current is very slow where the main access is. But just said it, you know, just again, hoping that Chief Buckley has weighed in with the, you know, amount of children and people using the path, if that's a concern. Okay. Um, we can certainly have him address that during the, the regular meeting, because I'm sure that the trustees would have a, a similar concern with regard to the safety. So uh, that's all That's all we have then for the, the Swan Pond path. These are all excellent suggestions. And um, if you want to stay around for our meeting later, of course, you'll be able to hear the trustees go through them and make final kind of design recommendations for the bid documents. So now, um, and maybe we can move through this one a little bit quicker. Uh, we're gonna move on to the swim club sidewalk uh, update. And this one is only for preservation and, uh, and LAC. So Director Tab, do you wanna run us through this, please? Uh, 
Director Tab, your uh, mic is off. Well, that'll help. All right. On September 3rd, 2020, the Village Board of Trustees requested the swim club to install an exposed aggregate sidewalk in the public right of way between Berry Pine Road and the driveway apron of the swim club as part of their project. The sidewalk would be at the expense of the swim club with the village taking over the maintenance responsibilities once installed. This past Monday, village staff met with swim club representatives on site to discuss the proposed sidewalk and identify the trees which would need to be removed as a result of the sidewalk installation. Staff advised the swim club on the expectations for replacement of the removed trees. If you look in the packet for this meeting, the last page does show the site plan and the contour of the proposed sidewalk. Uh, it also identifies the trees to be removed. Uh, so pretty much all I have on that subject. It was uh, not too many iterations as opposed to this, the Swamp Pond Path. So if anyone has any questions or comments on that, uh, feel free. Hey, uh, Chairperson uh, Pipel, do you want to run through your commission? Yep. Thank you, uh, President Sells. Yeah, uh, just a couple of quick questions for me to start out with. It looks like um, the proposed sidewalk is entirely within the village right of way, right? It's no longer within the uh, location of the current walk, which was within the property line of the pool. Um, do you know, do you know why that decision was made? The, uh, sorry, Dan. Oh, go ahead, Joel. Uh, that decision was made at the board of trustees meeting. Um, I, I honestly, I don't remember exactly why we decided. I think just because it's also a public path. Sure. You know, it makes sense. If the village is going to take responsibility for the path, it should probably be on village property, right? Um, I, I just have a concern because you were limited then to the, the narrow stripe, especially around where the stop sign is. It's a relatively narrow area there. And at one point to go around an AT&T pole, we get to four feet. So, I mean, if we had a little more flexibility and could sort of, and this probably is not even a possibility, if we could go on to pool property, then on to public right away, it could, because right now it's just a straight sidewalk that when it hits that pole, it just makes a really abrupt turn around the pole and it keeps going straight. So. There's never any consideration to kind of meander the path a little bit. So it's a little more natural as opposed to a straight path that hits a pole and then goes around it. I think that there were some thoughts initially, um, but to keep the path on the village right of way and then also to keep the path far enough away from the curb line so that the plows don't throw uh, the snow onto it, that pushed us to the very north edge of the, the parkway. Okay. And then the other, just another quick question. There's an at and switching box there that's not shown on the plan. And that's in a, approximately the location where the path is. So did just to make sure that somebody picked that up. The box is currently, it was mistakenly installed by at and onto Swim Club property. Um, a number of years ago. It is going to be relocated by AT&T, but only moved south by about 18 inches. Um, that's in progress. AT&T is, they have their process. Um, it will not be in, I'm looking at the plan on another screen here. Um, it will, that box is not in the way of the proposed sidewalk. Okay, thanks for clarification. Yeah, my only comment is just the abrupt nature of like straight path, hits a pole, goes around the pole, continues in a straight direction. If there's a way somebody could give it just a little bit more massaging, I think that would be amazing. But um, I realize why that may not be possible. I can, I can direct the architect to make that curve a little bit smoother. It is, yes, it is a touch abrupt. Uh, Kimber, do you have any comments? Um, I think my only comment was similar to yours. I was going to ask if the curve could be stretched out so that it's a more gentle curve. My concern, uh, 
is also for the kids. You know, so many of our children ride their bikes and um, there used to be a dip in the path. And that was where we had a lot of wipeouts and I could totally see this abrupt curve around the pole. I could see injuries and wipeouts. And so if we could just extend it, you know, so that it was a easier bend, not so abrupt. Great, thank you. Aberdeen, do you have any comments? Um, I echo uh, both yours and Kimber's comments on the, um, you know, desirability of uh, having a more meandering uh, appearance to the path. I also have a question. I see, um, you know, one of my pet peeves with all new sidewalks that have been done lately is how they terminate with the, um, into the ADA ramps. I see on the east side um, how it will interface with the uh, existing sidewalk and ramp, and that seems to be fine to me. Uh, but on the west side, with um, it, it is not specified on the drawing how that will uh, how that new sidewalk is proposed to end uh, at the driveway apron. And I just wanna be sure because there have been so many projects where they pour these um, curbs on either side of the sidewalk ends around the ADA ramps. These curbs are not necessarily required or necessary under the ADA. They're uh, more like soil stabilization uh, efforts. So I would just like to hope because I've never seen those curbs on any plans necessarily. So I just wanna make sure that it's not something that contractors throw in there at the last minute because they think they need to do it to stabilize the soil. I'd just like it to be spe specified, I guess, that we either regrade the soil on either side of the sidewalk to um, you know, go flush uh, you know, to be flush with the termination of the sidewalk, or um, if there's some other way to make sure that those don't sneak in there. Okay. Uh, start thinking of a way to word that in a motion, and I'll get back <laughs> to you, Matt. <laughs> uh, Matt Seymour? I have no comments. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Mike, do you have any comments? No, I agree with uh, what's been said. Great. I think they do uh, these curbs, this is a point of fact, is uh, because it's quicker, easier, and less expensive than grading uh, the, you know, the landscape around it. And unfortunately, it's not a good detail, but I think they do it just for cost savings. I would think that pouring concrete would be more expensive than regrading some dirt on either side of the path, but that's just my thought. Everybody's thought a lot about this. Um, <laughs> Sander, do you have any comments? Um, no, I agree with you, Charlie, on the meandering. It'd be nice if the path was a little more meandering rather than just these abrupt curves. I kind of agree with you on that. Um, other than that, I don't have any comments. Great. And Tom? Uh, two small things. One is I agree with uh, Aberdeen about the curbs on the sidewalks where they meet this, where they meet a street or whatever. Uh, I thought we had discussed this earlier with the village and were kind of assured that they would stop doing that in general. Like it was just a, just a bad, cumbersome, ugly uh, detail that we didn't want. So then the other thing I was going to say is uh, it may be okay considering where that sidewalk is to not worry about having it too close to the street so that snow gets pushed onto it during a, a big snow event. Because when that happens, uh, that sidewalk isn't very essential. Nobody's using the swim club uh, and there's a sidewalk on the other side of the street. So if it would help to the design to put it a little closer to the street in some places, I think that would be fine because there's nobody lives on that side of the street uh, and it wouldn't be a big deal if a few days in the middle of winter, if it got blocked off. That's a great point. Um, so that's a pretty much everybody's comments. Uh, you know, one other comment I just want to make is I'm noting that 10 trees are being removed 
And um, I'm sure Mike Collins um, has looked at this and he probably has some ideas on um, how that might be addressed. And maybe the he's working with the swim club on that, but it's always unfortunate to see tree removal for a sidewalk. So um, that's just a kind of a personal comment. <laughs> Mike, do you have any comments on that? Uh, well, you know, to be honest with you in assessing the trees that we're losing, uh, you know, some of them are fairly over mature hawthorns and uh, really not trees of uh, great value. And, and I think really that area will benefit from a reset altogether. I think landscape wise, a majority of that will take place on private property. But, um, you know, the swim club is offered to or we've discussed replacing trees one-to-one -to, -one, uh, to satisfy that. So I'm pretty comfortable with moving forward. That's really refreshing to hear. Thank you for that. So with that, um, let's move on to any recommendations. Um, if someone would want to put a motion forward so we can vote on it. Tom, can I'll you do it this time? I'll give it a, tr I'll give it a shot. Uh, I move that... Uh, we, rec we uh, make a finding and recommend to the village that the proposal uh, will not adversely affect uh, the uh, village's landmark designation uh, and, uh, and uh, along with the, the recommendation that we avoid having uh, curbs on sidewalks where they meet uh, uh, the street or driveway aprons, uh, that we consider uh, moving the sidewalk as necessary closer to the street, if that would help. Uh, and that uh, we try to soften the uh, abrupt curve caused by uh, trying to get around the utility pole. I'm not sure if there's anything else that we are recommending. No, that's what I have. So that's a great motion. If I have a second. I'll second. Thank you, Commissioner Osga. Uh, Kathy Haley, could you please call the, vote, the roll for us? Commissioner Coombs. Aye. Commissioner Kaplan. Aye. Commissioner Leary. Yes. Commissioner Marsh Osga. Yes. Commissioner Seymour. Yes. Commissioner Walsh. Yes. Chairperson Pipel. Yes. Motion passes. Um, thanks so much for participating, guys. Um, and thanks to all the people that are going to take part in this construction, these two important projects. We're really in favor of them. Uh, it's going to be wonderful things for the village. So glad we can participate. Thank you, Chairperson Pipel. So we'll move on now to LAC. Chairperson Maloney. Okay, let me just uh, pull our commissioners and see if anyone has a comment. And I'll start with Julie, Commissioner Julie Shea. I think Mike Collins' appraisal of the situation is right on the money. So we support him and um, a plan moving forward after the trees are removed. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Lambros. Yes, I agree with Julie and happy to hear that the 10 trees being removed are gonna be replaced. So in favor. Okay. Uh, let's see, Commissioner Plunkett. You still on? I agree totally with everybody else on this. I hate to see us lose trees, but I have a lot of faith in Mike that he's going to have some good input on this. So thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Okay, and I have no comments. Um, so if somebody could just make a recommendation, motion. Julie? I'm Go ahead. Oh, Mary, go ahead. Oh, I'd, I'd say I move that uh, we support the recommendations of uh, the committee on the, on the, the tree removal and uh, replacement. That would be it. Second. I second it. Um, Kathy Haley, I think I stole your role last time because I was thinking it was Kathy me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right, all right. <laughs> um, so uh, Commissioner Lambrose. Yes. Aye. 
Commissioner Plunkett. Aye. Commissioner Schaff. Yes. And Chairperson Maloney. Yes. Okay, that concludes our uh, review of these two issues by the, uh, the, the relevant commission. So I would ask for a motion and a second to adjourn the special meeting. From a trustee, please. I'll make a motion. By Ms. Evans, second by. Trustee Hannon. Second by Mr. Hannon, please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Oh, I'm sorry, Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Gallagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, please join us uh, for our regular meeting that will follow right after this. And to all the commissioners and board members who are here, uh, you are certainly welcome to stay with us. And if you have further comments or suggestions about these items, you're more than welcome to uh, bring them up during our regular meeting. So with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. President Sells, can I say one thing? Oh, yes. Uh, the COVID thing, right? Oh, no, not the COVID thing. I just no. wanted to let, let people know that, uh, you know, if you're trying to participate uh, as a commenter, et cetera, in the regular board meeting, uh, you need to use a separate Zoom link. Once this meeting is adjourned, um, you know, we'll have a short recess. And then if you access it via the, the different Zoom link uh, that's available on the Village's website, you'll be able to participate and comment at the Village board meeting. Thank you, Attorney Mars. Uh, meeting is adjourned.